People who commit acts of violent extremism and hate crime often say that they are victims of an injustice. This is what white supremacists say. They say that white people are the victim of a genocide and that multicultural policies discriminate against them. Is that true? Do white majority societies treat discrimination against white people in the same way in which they treat discrimination against other minorities? And if so, why should we have a double standard? So I've done a lot of research with young people in the north of England in areas that are multicultural and often racially tense. And a significant proportion of white young people and their communities feel that, um, say, hate crime rules within, within schools are actually about protecting minority young people not protecting everyone and they're, and they're implemented in an unfair way. So if there is a conflict or a fight between one, a white young person and a non-white young person, um, under those rules, too often teachers immediately think that the, the, the motivation of the white person to be involved in the conflict is a racist one, is a racially prejudiced one and hence this is a racial incident. So when they're recording something as a racial incident, which may actually be quite complex in, in, its, co in its causes, and even if race, racist language was used by the white person, it would maybe be wrong to assume that racism was the primary sort of motivation. It may, may have been a frustration or an aggravating factor as part of a much more complex personal conflict or argument. Um, and recording it in that way, um, it maybe simplifies at times. But also, a lot of white young people feel that they are punished because that incident is viewed as racist and so they are punished more harshly than the black young person even if both are thrown punches or taken part in violence because racism is seen as a more serious issue than simply youth violence. The white young people are punished more harshly now. It's always hard to know whether the individual story to which they sort of refer is factually accurate but we've heard that too many times and wider white communities feel that this is true. And th there's a famous sort of theorem, famous idea within sociology that says if enough people believe something to be true, it's true in its consequences. So significant parts of white communities, not just in Britain, but I think in other Western European countries, feel that these sort of laws which are on these policies are implemented unfairly and are done in a simplistic way to the detriment of white young people and maybe at times ethnic minority non-white young people are not punished as they should be for their part in a conflict. And what should we say to a white young kid who feels disadvantaged and discriminated against by multicultural policies? There's no d doubt that we need to have more difficult conversations and more work with communities to engage with those. One very clear thing that's come across with my own research in poor white communities in Britain is that those communities feel very strongly that no one listens to them, that government and society doesn't want to listen to them and judges them very harshly. They feel they're second class citizens and it's, that's not just aimed at minority communities, it's aimed at what they call as white middle class do-gooders who they perceive are more concerned with the needs of minority communities than with these white communities and that they don't want to be listened to. So one of, the, one of the things our research has showed very clearly is that we need to engage with those communities and first listen to them. And some of the research we've carried out for local government has had process benefits because people have been listened to and they've enjoyed being listened to and they've appreciated being listened to. But also one of the failings in the past of equality measures, certainly in Britain, has been um, to avoid difficult conversations. So if people have articulated, particularly in schools or youth work, have articulated either racist terms or very strong prejudiced view, views about opinions about minority communities. That's been seen as unacceptable. It should be punished. It should be halted. A warning should be issued. But all the academic evidence is that we need to let young people talk about those, partly to validate that they have a right to give their views. 
um, because otherwise we, we suppress that and it simply goes underground. But also we need to engage in a respectful but challenging way through educational processes and help those young people think through. Uh, we need to help them understand with complexity, and this is true of wider social issues, so preventing terrorism and violent extremes, and it's very clear that in preventative work we need to have difficult conversations and allow people to say challenging even radical things to help them understand complexity of ideas the fact that our own identities are complex because extremists are offering very simple solutions and similarly for white young people who feel they're second class citizens some of these campaigning groups or sections of the media are offering a simplistic understanding of what's happening to them whereas we need to help them un understand that it's complex, but also that they have a right to, to raise these issues. And fundamental to that also for me is contact between communities. Quite often these prejudiced views or feeling of resentment towards other communities is based from observation from a distance, not from contact. And if contact is done in the right way, what I think my own youth research has showed is that it doesn't solve problems. What it does is deracializes problems. That when young people of different backgrounds in a locality realize that they all worry about access to housing, they all worry about employment prospects or about success in education, then if communities are not getting enough, they realise that this is true for all communities, so it doesn't solve the problem, but it takes race and resentment to other communities out of, the, out of the picture and helps young people understand that the issue is whether they and their communities are getting the help and opportunities they should get. At the moment, a lot of communities, their understanding is very, seen, very much seen through a racial or ethnic lens and one of, one of resentment based on that. And that's obviously very dangerous for community cohesion and, and stability, but also I'd argue is it can be a source or a driver of extremism, possibly even movements towards violence in these different communities. And certainly some of the far right um, protest groups in England have become very violent in a street way based on articulating some of these resentments about minority communities, particularly Muslim communities, and perceptions of them being favourites, but also them being an engine of extremism, which is obviously a generalisation about the actions of a very small number of Muslims within much larger communities. I think certainly for some white people who feel they're not listened to, political actors such as protest groups, um, so the name Tommy Robinson, who was the founder of the English Defence League, He's certainly built up, and we don't want to overplay it, but he's built up a partial fo following by saying he's the man who will say the thing that no one else will say. He offers a very racial, racist interpretation of much more complicated social realities, such as child sexual exploitation cases, which are complex and very worrying phenomenon, but he offers it a, a very simplistic, this is all what minority men do to white girls, and they do it because they're white girls, not because they're available as a lack of social protection. But there are mainstream political actors who, who offer things, and arguably the Brexit campaign and some of the politicians who led that, without using racist language, have offered a xenophobic undertow that seems to offer solutions that coming out of Europe will deal with second class status, particularly for, for white communities. And certainly there's evidence that those sections of poor white communities have understood this as them getting their country back, not just from Europe, but maybe from minorities also.